Hey guys, I uh, really had no idea today what I'm <laughs> what I was bringing to the table, but uh, well, let's just see where I end up. But uh, first and foremost. God, whatever is on your mind, help me clear mine enough to get it across to me. And help me be a, a clear enough recipient to be able to convey every single bit of it. And give me the strength to see it through. So, I decided to, uh, after a little bit of a hiatus, I decided to get back into First John for a while. And it's only five chapters, and if I, I spent uh, probably three hours and some change this morning at work just listening to it over and over and over. And, uh, you know, man, it's that combined with uh, a lot of the stuff that, that God's been dealing with me on lately, as far as just personal, I don't know if sacrifice is the right word, but uh, what what I hold in esteem compared to him in my life. You know, as far as uh, like what Paul said, counting all things as loss. <sighs> so, after listening to First John, everybody that is that actually reads the book instead of just glosses over it, and they talk about how it's the love book, or, you know, whatever. But uh, I think he spends almost as much time calling people liars as he does talking about love. <laughs> so, irony, huh? Especially if you call somebody out in church for it. That's not walking in love. Yeah, whatever. So, what I'm hoping to do today is to uh, beat the religion out of our thinking, the way God's been doing it to me this last week or two or three or seven or eight years. But, you know, like what, like what John said, man, if anybody says they got to love the Father in them, but... Uh, they're clinging to things in this world. In modern day terms, they're full of crap. I'm talking about bitter and sweet water can't flow from the same source. Man, how much, how much really does God mean to any single individual person, to you, to me, whoever? How much do you mean to Jesus? Well, that's like a get out of jail free card. That's like a pass. Well, he was God's son. How about Paul? How much did God mean to Paul? How much did knowing Jesus mean to Paul? What did he mm -hmm. forfeit? <sighs> really? <laughs> what did Paul forfeit? Now we can read some of his resume in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. And that's just talking about mostly mostly physically what he went through. And then he talks about how worse than all that stuff, my deep concern for all the churches and how we're in you know, we get the sentence of death in ourselves and so on. And everybody just reveres Paul like some kind of Superman of God. Yeah. But how'd he get there? How did he get there? What did he have to give up in order to have more of God? He talks some about it. Hebrew, the Hebrew, Pharisees of the Pharisees. Uh, all of that. He had it all going for him. Compared to knowing Jesus, it was garbage. So, all that being said, what's God... What does God mean to me? Let's start easy, since I know nobody else is going to talk back during this right now. 
Mm-hmm. Funny how he asks me that when uh, <sighs> after I spent a couple weeks hiding from everything that I thought he'd been saying to me, didn't want to accept it. Spent all the time playing video games, kind of just leaving it in the back burner, but still just processing it and processing it. And then, and then God's like, so, uh, so about our relationship here, what's it worth to you? Bernard demanded I say hi guys so there we got that out of the way now you know I have officially started I'm not gonna repeat everything that I have uh, been through so far though mostly because uh, I don't remember it I just kinda like it's like reading a, uh, a teleprompter almost <laughs> and you know as far as what John was saying if anybody claims to love the Father but hates his brother, but loves the things of the world, they're a liar, truth's not in them, whatever, all that, you know, it says it a few different ways just to really get his point across. And, uh, you know, it's not like all of a sudden we just wake up and throw everything aside and just start chasing God. There's a, a counting of the cost involved here, too. There's a grace for that. There's a, a grace for that transitionary period. So long as... So long as we just keep striving forward. And uh, what's frustrating is so much of the church just, like, they just found this spot in God where they can just live in His grace. And uh, that's, that's not how God works, man. There's people I've seen at the prayer center that are the same today as they are when I started going there almost a decade ago. How much do they love God? <laughs> well, ouch, but hey, Shows, man, they're still the exact same. <sighs> so sometimes they're my uh, my litmus test. A lot of times it's just I look back where I was a month, six months, a year ago. I don't feel like five years should count because uh, I've definitely changed in five years. But the, uh, the speed of that transition is a proof of how much I love God. Sometimes, like just here recently, I'll just choke a little bit. And uh, I've been choking well, on different things, so that's something, at least. But then i got to wonder, man, if God told me something three weeks ago and I spent two and a half weeks trying to hide from it because I didn't want to admit it was him <laughs> how much different would I be today if I did exactly what he told me to start doing take things a day at a time don't plan ahead don't focus on the future don't make contingency plans one day at a time one day at a time one day at a time and here I am just trying to, to bully God into giving me a yes or no answer that I've been begging for all this time. <laughs> and then, you know, I finally shut myself up enough to hear from him. He's like, one day at a time. I was like, oh, come on. <sighs> so then, <laughs> so then I ignore the whole one day at a time thing and start doing things myself. And then it's like I feel all this stuff just kind of collapse in on me and 
It's like, I guess that was proof that I loved the, uh, the illusion of controlling my future more than I loved God. But hey, the important thing is I'm coming back to my senses. Not that I would have much choice if my word to God meant anything. Man, I remember when I was in high school, there was those uh, big emotional retreats that all the Christian church-going high schoolers go to. And uh, then there's that one big emotional night where God just really moves on people. And then just about everybody in our group promised that they were going to live for God and it was going to be awesome and they were going to see this through and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Some of them are still in church. Some of them still want to believe in God. They just uh, don't like the God that they were told to believe in. Most of them that are still in church don't even know God. If you want truth, it's there to reach out and grab. Of course it's uncomfortable, because it means examining ourselves and finding out just how wrong we were and for how long. If you want truth, man, it's right there. Even if it's just reading the Bible, and uh, God forbid you take the Gospels literally. Even if it means asking God to help teach you the Bible instead of your pastor or the pastors that you used to have. You ever notice how religion has all the answers for God instead of letting God answer for himself? I had to have a chat with a friend about that a while back. Same chat God had with me a couple of years ago. It was, uh, you know, trying to just playing out just thoughts in my head. I said, well, I wonder if God would help me do this. But no, I don't know. That's stupid. Why would God help me do that? That doesn't make any sense. He cares. He's got other things to worry about. And then, uh, you know, after God just listening to me get stupider and stupider like that, <laughs> he's like, man, take your blinders off. What do you think that I won't do for you? And it's like the light bulb came on. And uh, and now, it's like I'm on the other side of the table. I, just, I look at these things. Well, why won't God do that? And uh, there's been a couple times where I've been a little too liberal. And God's got to reel me in. He's like, well, I don't do this because of blah, blah, blah. And then you know, he'll spell it out for me, and I'll know better for next time. But I'd rather God be the one to reel me in than somebody's empty, hollow, unspiritual words. Well, spiritual words, but they don't mean anything. No, no, no life to them. <sighs> Another part in John... If one of you sees a brother or sister hungry, destitute of just daily necessities, and you shut up your heart, you just walk past them, you don't do a single thing to help them, how dare you say the love of God abides in you? The kind of love God has, man, I would... I would not very easily give up one of my dogs for the sake of somebody else, much less if I was God giving up Jesus, God's only begotten Son. God's a God of giving, man. You read Second Corinthians, Paul's talking about the offering 
to the Macedonians. You notice how a lot of preachers take that that whole scenario and use it to focus on their own ministry. Paul's talking about, hey, man, you give into this, it's going to these people over here that need it. I don't. That, it's not for me. It's for the rest of the church, man. That your abundance can supply their lack. So when it's flip side of their abundance will also supply what you're missing, that there may be equality. That is the love of God in money. <sighs> Another thing that I have been shouted down for several times, especially when I started... Uh, started finding myself in God, getting a little more confidence that maybe I was hearing him a little better than all these church people that talked a big game, but uh, had nothing going for him. I would get my jollies out of calling people out on stuff. You know, I mean, I used to be a lot more malicious about it than I am now. But shouldn't be about manipulation. It needs to be a heart issue between you and God, between me and God, every single person. We all find our place in God. Man, it's like God brings us all together. It's like the best neighbors we've ever had. <laughs> People talk about the, about the love of God like they know something about it. But they don't want to give up cable. I don't want to give up video games. I don't want to give up that uh, that piece of humanity that I'm still clinging on to myself. That God's asking me to hand to Him. It's just because I don't. Don't understand what he's doing yet with me. Do I love him enough to trust him with it? I'm getting there. But the flip side of that, when we can impartially just look at ourselves and our own life and see what we've done for him, what we've given up for him, and see what we haven't. That's the dipstick for how deep our love for God goes. How dare I say I'm full of God's love? Especially... If I choose somebody out that's doing 10 under the speed limit in the fast lane and I'm just trying to get home, take my shoes off from work. Man, I would tell somebody I'm full of God's love. What I'm full of is crap. Yeah, I've got God's love and I'm learning how to develop it. I'm in that transitional phase and I have stalled out so many times I lost count. But I'm getting there. God always brings it back to where is my heart? God's always asking me, what, what are you willing to give up? There's been several times God's like, hey, let's work on this now. I start looking at it, and I'm like, not yet. I'm good. Let's do something else. So, you know, then we just kind of like spin our lazy Susan around at the dinner table. You just see what else all is on there. And uh, you got to get something else. and be like, well, hey, you want to deal with this? You know, yeah, there's been times God's like, hey, we are dealing with this. You know, <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of choice. But when the uh, when the growth is at my discretion, and it's my choice to keep pushing in, kind of like fasting, then God's got a little more leeway in what, in, uh, in what I can decide to take care of. But by now... He's done a pretty good job of helping me tie up a lot of loose ends.
and we're getting to uh, some of the substance. Some of what I have always thought made me me. Then I got God over here asking for the rest of it. And I keep holding on to it like it means something. <sighs> so, how much do I love God? Not as much as I would like to convince everybody else that I do. And, man, somebody claims to be a Christian, you see how they act? You know, maybe give them a little bit of grace the first, second time. And then it just becomes evident that, hey, turns out <laughs> they want nothing to do with God. <laughs> or they want very little to do with God. They want the comfort that comes with knowing Him, that comes with salvation. Well, it comes with being familiar with God, not knowing Him. I hate throwing those terms around loosely. When they, the way people say them, that does not mean anything like the way they mean. Somebody says they know God, and the only time they spend with Him is at church, learning about God through the filter of somebody else's humanity that's got the microphone. I don't think you love God that much. Man, that kind of lie from the pulpit is exactly why so many of my friends want nothing to do with Christianity. Like they... Yeah, I'm talking about myself. Because, uh, <laughs> who else am I going to talk about? <laughs> if you knew me, you know I'm not that self-centered. But, if I'm trying to live my life as an encouragement, how am I going to be encouraging besides by opening up? How am I going to do that besides by talking about myself? My friends, man, they, uh, I said before that they can tell there's something different in how I approach them, how I approach church, how I approach God. Not from everybody, just from the people that they have known to be Christians. I'm not saying I'm the only one like this. There's just, why would, uh, if somebody's doing a fine enough job in their sphere, why would God put somebody else to do the same thing in that same sphere? There's plenty of other people like me that God can use to reach plenty of other people like the people I work with. But those people, man, they... God confirmed the authenticity of Jesus, of Paul, of Peter, of John, of the early church with signs and wonders. You think somebody at work was to break their thumb. I pray to God. God unbreaks it. Think that ain't going to get their attention? There's this guy at work. He's been... Uh, He's been dealing with seizures most of his life, but this last year, since about January, they have just amped up. Uh, it seems like he has uh, an average of at least two a month. Usually in the evening, like when he's taking a shower, he'll just black out and he'll wake up with this big hemorrhage in his head and blood all over the floor. So, 
how much do I love God? <laughs> enough to give him enough to step out on the faith that I think I have and give God a chance to do something in that guy's life? Don't think I haven't thought about it. God has had a uh, quite a few really, really intense, like in my face, heart to hearts with me in the last couple weeks. And uh, one of them was dealing with uh, with a type of evangelism. God's like, man, where I send you, where I send you, you think I haven't been working to open up a place for me to move, for me to, to work? All you got to do is get there. The opportunities are already lined up. I gotta do is just give me a chance, man. When God said that to me. I not. It has not exited my mind. Like it's supposed to be that simple, and then people start start getting all spiritual, and then they look constipated, like they're just so deep in thought. And it's, It's supposed to be about following God and just letting him work through us. Do we love him enough to just take him at that? That's what he said he wanted to do, man. He wanted us to get to know him so that we'd be in love enough with him to give him a chance to do something for other people through us. That is the gospel. That's why Jesus came. It really is just that simple in concept. In, ex in execution, when, uh, when our emotions start getting involved and our soul flares up, it feels like a whole different story. But the simplicity of the gospel is still right there all the time all the time <laughs> it's not complicated <laughs> like what Pam Bernard say <laughs> but you can't love God and be focused on on self you just can't not long term focused I mean yeah when God was dealing with me with this stuff do not think that I was not focused on myself I was looking at things that he was wanting that I was wanting and uh, you know, it's not much of a tug of war because God don't play that game a whole lot but those kind of times, right after God ministers to me, and I got a, and I get my own little reality check. Don't think I'm thinking about myself, <laughs> but it doesn't stay that way. I'm not always focused on myself. <laughs> like a lot of these people I work with, that you know, God has just told me they are not interested in Him at all. And it's funny, the theme among all those people is themselves. All they do is talk about themselves. And then they wonder why they're sick all the time and why they're depressed and why they're miserable and they don't like their life. They're not interested in God, man. They don't want truth. God just straight up told me that. Certain people there, man, not not that they're out of my reach uh, I guess jurisdiction is a better word God's got me where I'm at for certain people in particular 
and there's other people to reach the ones that are out of my jurisdiction, whether it's right this instant, um, this week, or whether it's next year, five years, ten years down the line, <laughs> when their brain is so burned out from coke that they're almost a vegetable. <laughs> The love of God's patient. You really have to remember that. Especially, especially when it comes to dealing with the people that we love. Mm. But... We gotta be careful who we let in. As far as the people that say they're Christians, man, you read Paul's letters, he has a much, much, much higher standard for Christians than he does for anybody else. He talks about uh, in First Corinthians. He, I've been wanting to read this, but I got stuck in First John, where he's called, <laughs> where he calls everybody liars, but. Uh, I like how John is just like, hey, you say you love God and you're acting like this, you're full of crap. But Paul's like, hey, you know, you guys, you're in good shape. These people that are trying to take you from me, they're going to burn. Paul's in your face in a, uh, he's, much, he's much different in your face than John. But Paul talks about, uh, talks about dealing with Christians and who was he, he uh, it's been a, a week or so a week or two since I read it but the gist of it is he's like you know I don't care what the people outside the church are doing they have no moral compass we have the Holy Spirit we are in this family we are supposed to be of, of unified mind vision heart spirit and goals and if you're deviating from that, we're going to have a heart-to-heart, -heart and we're going to set things straight. But as far as people outside the church, to the weak, I became weak. That was where he exercised his liberty and how he reached people. Not being without law towards God, but also not having the, the pretenses of religious crap, having to jump through hoops. It's about having that lifeline to God as we're reaching for these other people. Not this lifeline to the pulpit, or this lifeline to respect for, from other people, or of admiration, or of self-renown, or whatever else. If our lifeline to God's in good shape, why can't we reach these people that God has put within reach, that God wants us to reach. Do we love God enough to be uncomfortable? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Prove it. That's what I've been having to do. Because either I told God I wanted everything he had for me, Either I meant that, or I'm full of crap. And I don't want to be full of crap. But if you think there ain't things between you and God, that's going to be the first uncomfortable thing you find. <laughs> <sighs> but... God's always there, man. You stretch yourself a little bit, he is right there. He'll keep you balanced. And you keep that lifeline with him, keep that line of communication, pray in tongues, pray in tongues, pray in tongues, pray in tongues. And you keep your heart tight with God. 
He'll keep you on a straight and narrow. And if you don't like what he's got to say and then you start going off the straight and narrow and head over this way where it's a little more comfortable, as soon as you start thinking, well, maybe that was a bad idea, he brings you right back. There's more, but I think uh, I think that's about it for this go around. I think it's okay to. John talks about testing the spirits, and uh, yeah, we can develop a spiritual ear. But we also still need to learn who God is, what his boundaries are, how he talks, what he wants from us, his, the way he approaches us. Because uh, there's a lot of times when it's spiritual, it comes from that avenue, but it ain't God. It's okay to test the spirits in people too. Maybe just by watching them. That's the easiest way to do it. But it usually takes a little longer too. But it's not unchristian to do that. Man, you want to know what's unchristian? You ask God. He'll be the one to tell you, hey, you know. Time to get back in line. It's not about, once you can hear from God, it's not about turning to people. It's about being the person that led you to God. It's about being that same person for other people. It's about paying that same kind of, of, of grace and patience and salvation forward. But, if you're listening to somebody that's putting you through all these hoops to jump through, that focuses more on uh, that focuses more on doing than becoming. Let me elaborate on that. If somebody's more focused on jumping through hoops just because that's what you're supposed to do instead of like, uh, you know, hey, it's time to give this up. It's time to learn how to pray in tongues. It's time to... You need to start setting aside five, ten minutes with God every day. You need to read this book, you know, for not uh, this book of the Bible, not just this book. Because there's that, because there's a sense of guidance that leads to maturity. And then there's just the to-do list that leads you in a perpetual circle, round and around. It doesn't build you up. It's just a rat race. Man, if you don't think you owe it to yourself, to test these spirits, man, you owe it to God because he bought you with a price. And if it means calling somebody out for being full of crap because they are wrong and they're leading other people wrong, that's what it comes down to, man. Christians were never meant to not have a backbone. Before I really got to know God, that was my biggest fear about getting into ministry. It was just being a pushover. Now, I got to know God, and uh, he ain't a pushover. Like, what the, uh, the example that always stood out to me was uh, when Paul was being detained, 
and he called this guy a whitewashed tombstone, which you know, yeah, don't mean much to us, but to the Jews, it's <laughs> you may as well be calling his mom a whore. <laughs> You know, I mean, different. That was a more religious term, what they used. But uh, as far as bringing it home, and uh, so then one of these guards that was detaining Paul struck him. I don't know why they slapped him, punched him, whatever. They're like, you dare talk to the high priest that way? And Paul's like, oh, my bad. Didn't know he was the high priest because the law says don't talk bad about your elders or you know whoever, whatever it was that uh, that part of the law that Paul quoted. I think we can all agree that Paul was not a pushover. But he understood authority between him and God. And how to be an example of submission to other people. And that's something I've been really striving for. More of the love of God <laughs> in action. But people aren't supposed to be pointing you to themselves. They're supposed to be pointing you to God. Man being jointly fit together by the head. There is no ministry on earth that is the head. Man, we're being fit together within Christ, the body, which is the church. We're supposed to find our place in that not be told by other people where our place is. Because then, how is our heart supposed to be in that? How are we expected to have the tenacity and the fortitude to be able to see our whole life all the way through when it's going to be almost nothing but trials in the flesh? Or naturally, or in this earth, however you want to say it. Man, we ain't supposed to get our direction from men once we start being able to hear from God. There was a... Uh, <laughs> one real good friend of mine was starting to get into Ecclesiastes and uh, this was when they were just starting to come around and I just laid down the law so you got no business in the Old Testament until you find out who Jesus is who God really is under this new dispensation and what God wants for you and in you and from you and out of your life you got no business in the Old Testament of course that was a fight and of course, a little while later, after uh, the concession and the reading of Colossians and then Galatians and then Ephesians, I think, then they were like, well, yeah, I guess you were right. Thank you for being so firm. There is such a difference between being that, being like, uh, you ever go bowling and then you got these little bumpers where the gutters are to keep the ball on the, on the, uh, in the lane? <laughs> For new Christians, men, that is what we're supposed to be. As these people gradually get to know God, as they become established in God. If you're looking for a notch on your belt, just because you helped somebody, you led somebody to God, you led them in the sinner's prayer, you got them praying in tongues, whatever, it's time to re-examine your motives. Did God say, hey, awesome job, way to go, sport. That's what we're supposed to be living for. Not a belt full of notches at the end of our life. And then hear God say, what, what were you doing? I don't even know you. Because uh, I think there's going to be more people that hear that than they realize. Now, I really think I'm done. So, love you guys.
and uh, pray for me. <laughs> Talk to you later.